Tonight, the parties debate for your vote. Six leaders defend their plans and attack their opponents. Mr. Trudeau, you are a phony and you are a fraud. That's Mr. Bernier, Bernier, only your role 6%, on this stage tonight seems 6%. to be to say publicly what Mr. Scheer thinks privately. No. We've got the issues, the key moments, and the spin. Plus, we are checking the leader's facts. You do not need to choose between Mr. Delay and Mr. Deny. Did all the talk change minds? A group of undecideds weigh in. Also tonight, Donald Trump's allies and opponents hammer his decision to move troops from Syria. And the cost of prescription drugs. Why making meds free doesn't mean people will take them. This is The Nation. This federal election campaign has gone from huge promises to shocking, offensive images, and yet polls have been static, suggesting some voters may just be tuning in. Yeah, and a critical moment to do just that tonight for the big English language debate. You are a phony and you are a fraud. We have you, to actually a slogan this. is not a plan. No. What you are doing, Mr. Scheer, is playing this old card, Quebec is corrupt. No. Mr. Scheer, you might remember that, Mr. Singh, you might remember that summer I'm very, uh, very argument different from over, Mr. Scheer. Over, you I got realize. it. You got yeah. it. I mean, you look so alike, it's really taller. difficult for me. No corporation is above the law. I was the only one who said that. That's not true. With six leaders sharing the stage, each had a small window to make a big impact with millions of Canadians watching. Rosie saw the action closer than any of us. She was one of the debate moderators. That's right, Andrew, and there was action in Quebec, uh, in Gatineau, Quebec, tonight for sure. I'm not far from the debate stage here at the Museum of Canadian History. It's just across the river from Ottawa, from Parliament Hill, in fact, and that's where the leaders had their chance to speak directly to you, to voters, not to mention pointedly at times to one another. So let's get right to what happened on stage with a look at the highlights. Here's our Katie Simpson. <laughs> A moment of civility in a campaign mired in mud, though it didn't last long given the crowded stage and high stakes. Mr. Trudeau, you are a phony and you are a fraud and you do not deserve to govern this country. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer went negative right off the bat, setting the tone for a series of testy exchanges between the front runners. I have nothing to learn from Mr. Trudeau, who fired the first Indigenous Attorney General for doing her job. You've canceled two pipelines, and the one you bought, you can't build. I, I well. am accepting Sorry, the fact that I'm going to be attacked for uh, not you. building pipelines from some thank and you. for building pipelines we'll for others. Getting... Liberal leader Justin Trudeau was attacked on all sides, taking hits over his record, including on the environment. It's so heartbreaking for me to look at you today and know you could have done so much more the last four years. Please, God, you don't get a majority this time around from because the you Rockies, don't keep your promises. From the Rockies to the Bay of Fundy, Conservative premiers have gotten elected on promises to do nothing on climate change, and we need a strong That's federal right. government to fight them. Just because you say something over and over and over again doesn't make it true. Oh, the, there is it would no be nice Canadian. for you to learn there that, is Mr. No Canadian. As Trudeau there's, fought there's no back, Canadian NDP leader Jagmeet Singh tried to present himself as a credible priority. alternative. You do not need to choose between Mr. Delay and Mr. Deny. There is another option. <laughs> There is another option out there. Though Singh and Green Party leader Elizabeth May did offer Trudeau some backup, taking on Scheer over his climate plan and his overall pitch to Canadians. At this point, Mr. Scheer, with all due respect, you're not going to be prime minister. The question is going to be on a seat count if we have Mr. Trudeau in a minority. All of the leaders were able to get some shots in at each other. But with tonight's format, with answers limited mostly to under 60 seconds, some leaders were frustrated there wasn't an opportunity for lengthy discussions. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. So clearly at moments like this, the rhetoric is flying. Party leaders sometimes make claims that actually don't really stand up to scrutiny. So we asked Salima Shifty to watch tonight's debate with an eye to checking some of those facts. Uh, in just four years, we've reached three quarters of the way to our 2030 targets, which we will meet and surpass. But we know that's not enough. We're going to continue to do more. The latest report from Environment Canada shows Canada is shy of three quarters of the way to our Paris targets, 79 megatons short. Plus, those calculations include both policy and projections. 
The Liberals have announced more measures this election, again, without a detailed breakdown on how many megatons they would cut. Justin Trudeau calls his plan ambitious but doable. It's the doable that's an open question. There is no Canadian that believes that they're going to be better off by paying a carbon tax. You have given a massive exemption to the country's largest polluters, and your plan the is already the experts failing. Andrew Scheer is ignoring the rebates Canadians receive when they file their tax returns to offset the higher price at the pumps and elsewhere in the provinces where the federal carbon tax applies. As for exemptions, there are larger thresholds for some industries so they can stay competitive abroad, but those large emitters will still pay for whatever they emit above that set threshold. We look at the track record of this government, and in reality, Statistics Canada points out in 2017, the wealthiest actually paid less in tax and gained more in wealth. It's true. StatsCan does show that the tax rate for the wealthiest 1% went down slightly from 2016 to 2017. But that's not on the federal government, led by Justin Trudeau, who changed the tax rate when he first came into office. It was because of lower provincial tax rates. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Just to look at some of the things that were misleading tonight in the debate. For their thoughts and analysis, let's, let's, analysis, let's bring in Vashi Capellas, host of Power and Politics, and David Cochran, who's been, of course, reporting on the campaign from the road a little bit and, and in the office from the start. Okay, uh, I'll start with you, David. Everyone was wa watching it from their vantage points. Uh, and I don't know if we all came to the same conclusion, but why don't you start us off in terms of how you think everyone did? Well, I want to start with what the Conservatives are telling me about uh, Andrew Scheer's performance tonight. I mean, there's clearly, look, six candidates on this stage, one target for Andrew Scheer. That is Justin Trudeau. They wanted to attack him early. We saw the phony and the fraud language right out of the gate. Very tough language, an uncivil language for a debate. But the Conservatives have been trying to attack Justin Trudeau on affordability and credibility, and they went hard at his credibility early. Here's some more of what Andrew Scheer said this, tonight. Justin Trudeau only pretends to stand up for Canada. You know, he's very good at pretending things. He can't even remember how many times he put blackface on. Because the fact of the matter is, he's always wearing a mask. He puts on a reconciliation mask and then fires the Attorney General, the first one of Indigenous background. He puts on a feminist mask and then fires two strong female MPs for not going along with his corruption. He puts on a middle-class mask and then raises taxes on middle-class Canadians. So there you go, Rosie. That's Blackface, Essence Lavalin, Jody Wilson Raybould, and Jane Philpot all wrapped up in one answer. Uh, the anger and affordability is what's driving the Conservative campaign right now. The response from the Liberal War Room tonight is that Sheer looked way too angry tonight. Mm -hmm. And in their view, that's something that could hurt him this debate. This is the Liberal spin, sure, not yeah. David Cochran's interpretation. But Trudeau was able to do what I'm calling the three C's: climate, conservative, and choice. In an election where people say there is no ballot question, he tried to make climate the ballot question. He's made it clear that the Conservatives from the Rocky Mountains to the Bay of Fundy won't do anything. Neither will the Conservatives at the federal level. So the choice is between him mm -hmm. or Andrew Scheer. Now, Jagmeet will object. He, Jagmeet Singh had some good moments tonight. We saw him in Katie's thing. But that is how Scheer went hard after Trudeau tonight. And how yeah, Trudeau I mean, thinks he, he did. definitely went, it was very aggressive, I will say, right out the front door without even really addressing the actual question, which was about himself and leadership. And I wonder if there was a risk to to doing that. I get the strategy. I just wonder if yeah. there was a risk. In I it don't as know. Well. I think it was deliberate. I think he's speaking to people who want to vote conservative sure. and he's mobilizing his base in an election where we see the polls as static as they are. That could end up being something very important. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin Trudeau has a base that is there as well. Well, but perhaps maybe not as motivated, especially given the performance that we saw from Jagmeet Singh tonight. I don't know, and I, I have no idea if that's going to make a difference. Yeah. We've seen his own favorables yeah. increase a bit over the past few weeks. The party hasn't followed with it, so that, that could not be the case. But I think, you know, I, I don't know if there's a risk. I know it's a deliberate strategy. Obviously, they came out swinging from the start, knowing that that clip would be played, I think, four or five times in the first 10 minutes of this newscast. <laughs> <laughs> so they won that clip marathon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I... I'm loath to ask whether anyone won or lost, so I won't do that because I think it's an unfair question and not a realistic one either. But did anything change tonight for anyone? For anyone? Did anything, you know, did you watch that and say, okay, that person's got a little bump or something? I know Jugme Singh was trying to get moments where he could contrast himself with Justin Trudeau, and I think he got a few of those. Yep. He had a lot of good moments where he was very genuine and humane and also quite funny, and, you know, Mr. Delay versus Mr. Deny, and, and one point where... 
he, he was criticizing Trudeau for not being consistent. He said, look, you fought to keep SNC-Lavalin out of court, but you're dragging indigenous children into court. So he's coming at him like hiving off that progressive credibility. I mean, this is the challenge for Trudeau on this. The conservatives' base is motivated. Five to five and a half million people, that's what they're going to get. And they would vote three times if they could to take out Justin Trudeau. It's holding together that progressive coalition. He, he survived the TVA debate last week that they think sort of unscathed. He was attacked a lot more tonight. But the format and yeah. the dispersal it allowed him to hide a little bit, and he might have been dirted up a little bit, but I don't think he was fatally wounded. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Did anything change for, for anybody? Or, uh, or for the voter, for that matter? Yeah, for the voter, I'm really less sure, definitely. I don't know. That's that's a tough one. I'm not sure they were able to, especially if they're undecided going into this, be able to then feel like, okay, various positions and policy positions were articulated to me. I would say, to pick up on David's point, I, I would be watching Jagmeet Singh over the next little while to see if this made a difference. It feels too early to, mm -hmm. to judge mm -hmm. that. Just be, The only reason I think it might is because it's building on some momentum that already existed. I'm not saying he's going to overtake any no. of the leaders no. or anything close to to that but it will be interesting to see if he can capitalize the party more largely can capitalize on what feels like uh you know as you said a human and and kind of above expectation performance and whether that translates at chipping away at some of the uh, progressive vote for the liberals yeah and and we should say that anytime we say that the ndp had a mo had a moment the conservatives rejoice because they know that those votes split will then work in their favor and of course one other debate uh in thursday mm -hmm. on thursday in french thank you both appreciate your both Thanks, of your Rosie. coverage tonight and that is it from <laughs> for us from gatineau tonight we'll uh, send it back to andrew and adrian in toronto with the day's other news all right, Rosie, your marathon is over for tonight. Uh, we are starting in the United States within hours of Donald Trump's sudden decision to pull U.S. troops from northern Syria, putting Kurdish people in harm's way came exactly what many had feared. So as Paul Hunter tells us, reports already of Turkish airstrikes in exposed Kurdish areas. At a military base in northern Syria, evidence today U.S. troops wasted little time in following orders already effectively abandoned, as American troops seem to move quickly to get out of there. On the surprise word from Donald Trump, the U.S. is now pulling back its military presence in northern Syria. We want to bring our troops back home, and I got elected on that. Said Trump in the White House today, if not now, then when? Earlier, tweeting more bluntly, it is time for us to get out of these ridiculous, endless wars. Adding separately, knowing we can always go back and blast. Reaction was equally blunt and fiercely critical, not least by some of Trump's fellow senior Republicans. This impulsive decision by the president has undone all the gains we've made, thrown the region into further chaos. Iran is licking their chops. And if I'm an ISIS fighter, I've got a second lease on life. Among the many concerns, the fate now of Syrian Kurds, who'd fought alongside U.S. troops there for years, now deemed at serious risk of an onslaught by Turkish forces, whose president has long seen the Kurds as a threat. Tweeted Nikki Haley today, Trump's own former ambassador to the United Nations, regarding the decision to abandon the Kurds, leaving them to die, she wrote, is a big mistake. But Trump had a retort for his critics. If Turkey does anything that I, in my great and unmatched wisdom, consider to be off limits, I will totally destroy and obliterate the economy of Turkey. Tonight, video that appears to show an assault underway already in northeastern Syria, with shelling said to be from Turkey toward Kurdish-held areas. Some questions for Trump now. What does he consider to be off limits? What line would have to be crossed in Syria? And what exactly would the U.S. do if it is? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Well, the U.S. pullout sets the stage for a new war in Syria between Turkey and the Kurds. The Assad government's war against the rebels never really stopped. With Russia's help, it has been squeezing the Islamist-held Idlib province. Chris Brown saw that front firsthand, the scene heartbreaking and set to get worse. Syria's ruinous war may be headed for a final terrible phase. We're with Russia's military, the only way for most media to get to the front lines in Idlib province. Through the windows, we see the destruction from the Syrian government's most recent offensive. 
The stops are short and chaotic, and some events appeared staged for our benefit, including this celebration of Syria's dictator Bashar al-Assad in the town of Saran. 80-year-old Amina told us she welcomes the return of Assad's troops as she wasn't able to get food or water for days. Haloud Latkani said the terrorists who were pushed out were killing civilians. Still, it's telling that most who lived here actually fled in the other direction, further into Idlib, rather than risk living under government rule again. Assad's prisons are crammed with tens of thousands of opponents, and the West considers him to be a war criminal. The Russians also wanted to make sure we saw this, a remarkable cave complex dug deep into a hillside. Until a few weeks ago, it served as headquarters for anti-Assad forces in this part of Idlib. This underground complex appeared to have everything, water, electricity, it was stockpiled with food, enough to help the militants carry on the fight against Syria's government for more than six years. There was even a jail and torture area with blood on the floor, underscoring that the opposition Hayat Tahrir al-Sham militants fighting Syria's government have brutal methods too. The world must thank Syria and their Russian friends for standing up to terrorism, the Syrian general told us. The destruction we saw was the aftermath of a modest incursion by Syria into Idlib when the final offensive comes could be a humanitarian catastrophe. Chris Brown, CBC News in Syria's Idlib province. We have more news ahead on The National, including a CBC News exclusive. You're going to hear from a family shocked to learn how their loved one's body was being stored. Now they're demanding answers. And later, we ask undecided voters how they think the federal leaders did in the debate tonight. And we're following a police investigation in Ontario. A 14-year-old student killed outside a high school in Hamilton. We'll have the latest. The National, back in two minutes. We've got an update now on an exclusive story we brought you last month. It concerns the way bodies were stored and handled outside the chief medical examiner's office in Edmonton. Now, they were stored in a rented truck and handled in a way that tonight has a family affected by the scandal demanding answers. Charles Rusnell heard from them. I feel like my brother's body was desecrated. I have to live with that for the rest of my life. This is what upset the family of Bryce Sather. He was just 25, awaiting a kidney transplant when he died in early September. His family was emotionally prepared for his death, but nothing could prepare them for how his body was treated. It was just disgusting to see the way they could show the lack of care or empathy towards someone's deceased family member. Treating them worse than, like, dead cattle dragging him across the floor. Despite debilitating health problems, his brother Raymond Pizzi said Sather lived, as best he could, a happy, full life. In preparation for his funeral, his family arranged for a funeral home to transport his body to Calgary. To see the body pulled on the floor as opposed to being carried or moved onto a stretcher was very disheartening. Funeral director Jeff Hagel takes full responsibility for his employees' treatment of Sather. Hagel says Alberta's chief medical examiner ensured the body had not been damaged. And he says he and the medical examiner personally told the family about the video and apologized. It's a very difficult conversation. Alberta Justice launched an investigation after CBC News broadcast the video, but now won't say if it will release its findings. Pizzi says his family and the public deserve answers. This could be anybody. It could be your daughter, it could be your wife, it could be your grandma, your mom. It shouldn't just be swept away like it was nothing. Alberta's justice minister and the chief medical examiner declined an interview request. Charles Rusnell, CBC News, Edmonton. Okay, let's get to our national newsroom in Vancouver now, where Ian is tracking other stories for us. And Andrew, let's begin in Hamilton, where a 14-year-old was killed outside of his school. 
a bicycle and backpack, all that remained in front of Sir Winston Churchill Secondary. The victim was with his mother when the attack happened. He was rushed to hospital but died a few hours later. Yes, it should not be happening, you know. Our kids, the kids should feel safe to go to school. Three suspects are in custody, but officials continue to search for two more. In Toronto, police are searching for the driver they believe intentionally ran over a 16-year-old boy. A witness accounts that the, the victim was being followed uh, prior to the collision. Uh, and then there was an interaction and then the collision. Video obtained by CBC News shows a dark-colored SUV in the area at the time of the incident. Police say they are searching for two people believed to be white men between the ages of 20 and 35. And a multiple vehicle crash involving the RCMP in Richmond, just outside of Vancouver, sent one person to hospital. At least two police vehicles and two other cars with severe damage, as you can see in this video. Officials say a patient from a nearby hospital stole a cruiser as an RCMP officer was trying to arrest him. The man then allegedly rammed that police car into at least two, three other vehicles. A woman is being treated for serious injuries. An RCMP officer was treated for minor injuries. More stories developing tonight in about 20 minutes. And ahead on The National, a closer look at pharmacare. If prescription drugs were free, would that actually improve people's health? We'll break down some new research. First, though, we brought together a group of undecided voters to watch tonight's debate. Up next, they tell us how they think the leaders did. We uh, had a huge fight uh, with the wealthiest Canadians and the Conservatives yeah. when we closed tax loopholes that Mr. Scheer is going to reopen. Justin Trudeau only pretends to stand up for Canada. You know, he's very good at pretending things. He can't even remember how many times he put blackface on. Every single day of my life is challenging people who think that you can't do things because of the way you look. Every single day of my life, I channel the frustrations of people who feel that as well. Mr. Scheer, that may be the worst idea in your whole non-platform, is the cutting of foreign aid. So there's a taste of what voters heard in tonight's leaders debate. Undecided voters can really swing election results, especially in a race as close as this one. So if you went into tonight's debate, an undecided voter, how did you emerge? Did any moments make their mark? Last week, undecided voters came to this studio to put their questions directly to the leaders. And three of them returned to watch the debate. Dina Barakat, a consultant in legal tech and brand new Canadian. Marcus Harvey of New Brunswick, who's really worried about climate change. And Jessica Heron of Cold Lake, Alberta, a mom, school bus driver and student. Armed with snacks, social media, comfy chairs and a TV, they settled in. Yeah, this should be good. Where did he get that number from? Did they just become best friends? This is interesting, this little dynamic though, isn't it? Please God you don't get a majority this time around from because the you Rocky. don't. Oh, 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 oh. And so, the verdict. So a whole lot of talking, and there are a lot of crowded talking going on. First impressions, Marcus. Um, the talking, yeah, there was a lot of it there. Too many people on the stage. If they'd trimmed it down to the top four, I think a lot more would have got said, a lot more would have been purveyed uh, in a better manner than, than what happened there tonight. You're nodding, Dina? Yeah, it was really difficult to he like under hear what they were saying sometimes when they were talking over each other, especially like Trudeau and Scheer at certain points. Like, they went in a bit too hard, I think. Do you, do you agree they went in too hard? Uh, I think it was embarrassing to watch them go at each other like that. It seemed like a bunch of children up on a stage. Was there a moment, though, Jessica, that, that, that's still rattling around for you? There's a one moment that's really sticking with me is when Sheer challenged uh, Trudeau about bending the rules um, regarding jobs, and Trudeau said that he is essentially protecting jobs which he, that's not why he bent the rules. He bent the rules to protect a few thousand jobs in Quebec, but he didn't say boo when there was 150,000 unemployed in Alberta. So that one sticks for me. Do you, you all came into this as undecided voters. Looking back at it now after this debate, would you still call yourself an undecided? For me, yeah. 
yeah, I'm still leaning towards Shear, but uh, the strong performance of Jag tonight uh, really, uh, he did really well. I thought he carried so quite nicely. It's Jag now, right? Not, not Jagmeet Singh, you've just oh, shortened yeah. it to Jag. <laughs> yeah, Jag, that's your new name. <laughs> what, about, what about you, Dina? Um, I'm focused on two parties, but also, if I can be honest, is I understand why a lot of young people choose not to vote. If this is what they're seeing, and mm. Mm -hmm. like, I really understand those grounds now. So, when sorry to say, I know it's, it's okay. a privilege, <laughs> and I should be like, everybody go out and vote, but I do understand, because I'd look at this and be like, who? Not even who I think like. But our candidates why? don't even treat it like a privilege. Yeah, so we, it's a privilege, but they're abusing it, essentially. You you have used the sort of the disheartened word. You, you've sort of had the feeling of being disheartened. Certainly when you know when you were speaking with the leaders last week, and I'm, you said something really interesting. You said you wanted to vote for someone who was going to cause the least amount of damage. Was there anything that gave you an element of hope? today or an element of I could get behind that I do love how they're like everybody's talking about what's happening nationally they're um, representing like certain parties are representing for the people the su like the suffering that's happening within certain classes of society also I think once you're elected though it's going to be how are you going to be able to balance what you're promising them because like it's very anti-corporations or mm -hmm. you need them. You're also going to be working to serve them. So I don't, I, I'm not an economist. I don't understand all of that, but it just doesn't make sense in my head. Like, are you going to be able to execute all of this? The how are you going to pay for it? How are line? you going to pay for it? I heard a laughter coming out of this room, a fair amount of laughter. What was, what was so funny for you? Or was it, des um, was it sort of frustration laughter? I think it was almost like a black humor kind of thing. Like it was just, it was so gross and uh, we had to find a way to make fun of it somehow. So we were treating it like it was just pure entertainment yeah, instead of a, a political main stage. How will this land at home for you in Cold Lake? For, for your friends, for your colleagues who might be watching tonight, how, how will the this debate? land? The mm -hmm. debate? Um, I'm not sure how many people actually watched the debate. Um, are you, I, I mean, are you suggesting that that it's so uninteresting that people won't vote? I mean, do you think that there's a an enthusiasm gap for this? Election? I think that's a what we just saw is a huge reason why people don't go out and vote, because um, that's not what Canada represents. We don't. That's not what we stand for. And to watch six adults stand on a stage pointing fingers and name calling is is gross. We're not American politics, so why would we elect somebody like like that? And there was the confusion too of six of them being there. Like I said, if there was only four, mm -hmm. a lot more would have got covered and maybe it wouldn't have been as mired as it was. But yeah, it was it was, you know, a little messy. What about where you live in New Brunswick? How, how will this land there? Um, as far as playing in New Brunswick, we just got rid of a, a liberal um, uh, provincially as our premier. We've got a conservative in there now. And, uh, you know, the Maritimes tends to be liberal, but I, after this, like, it, you know, like we've been saying, it was just such a, a mess. Like, you, out of all of this tonight, and I think I was on social media and I said to, you know, my friends, I said, you're watching it, what are you saying? You know, what are you seeing? And, and Jagmeet Singh, through my friends anyway, which are a lot of them in New Brunswick, uh, seem to kind of come ahead uh, as the most... Professional, he yeah. held diplomatic, he held yeah. himself really well. He's like, okay, that them, I think he knew what the, was gonna happen yeah. to the right of him, to the right of him, but he held himself really well. Dina, what do you need to hear in the next two weeks? Because there's still time. Oh, I haven't heard anything about foreign affairs or what they're intending to do with like mm -hmm. what's going on outside of our borders that's going to impact all of these projects and all of these things that you're going to do. Um, I'm not looking to hear for, I think I'm looking for the party that will acknowledge the complexity of it. That's courage for you to say the situation is terrible or the situation is whatever word you want to use, but 
just acknowledge it for your for the voters you want to like get and then I'd be like okay at least you recognize that and but if you're just not going to talk about it and be like we're going to be able to do all of this and there's you know there's nothing over there for us to worry about that's concerning and what do you need to hear Jessica um I mean I still my key values um jobs in Alberta and climate crisis aren't those two part or those two views for me don't align with any one party still so I just I need to find my little niche of where I fit there's still a little bit of time but there not is. that much yes and if uh, mr. Singh like I know he said no trans mountain that's gonna piss off a lot of people um, but the world is changing and if we want to keep up with it we need to change as well um, so if he says, you know what, we're going to cancel Trans Mountain, we're still going to keep oil going until we have an alternate resource. Um, and once that resource comes along, we're going to train Alberta oil workers and transition them, then he would have my vote in the bag, for sure. One last thought. <clears throat> what would each of you say to the leader that you spoke with last, last week? You, you spoke with Andrew Shear. What would you say to him? I think as we go into the end of this, I would tell him to listen. Listen to um, the people of Canada. Um, maybe, you know, there's a lot of, st there's, there were some underlying comments in there from other leaders towards him uh, about his faiths and beliefs. Um, kind of pull back from that. You know, keep your core Christian values, use that to, as your moral compass, but as far as your beliefs and your uh, opinions, don't let that dictate policy and don't let it tread upon you know the rights of of hard-fought uh, battles that have already been won by minorities and and uh, you know people that are have been held down so far he's and don't be such a robot like he's, he's he just kind of faded you know we discussed that he just he just was all in his head already he knew what he was gonna do and he just kind of blended into the crowd Dina, you, you still look disheartened, arms crossed. What, what would you say to me? <laughs> um, I'd say keep going. Uh, I think for my my questions that I relayed, I don't think any of the leaders would have answered like a direct answer, any of the politicians. So um, best of luck, I guess. You are going to vote. Oh, You're definitely. I'm, I'm using this opportunity. <laughs> I wait thirty years. <laughs> and Jessica, um, you spoke with a liberal leader, Justin Trudeau. I would, if he gets reelected, I would like to remind him that he works for us. We elected him. Right now, we are interviewing him for the job of Prime Minister of Canada. Um, and if he is elected, he works for us. He doesn't work for the Liberal Party. He doesn't operate in the best interests of the Liberal Party. He operates in our best interests and he needs to listen to what people across Canada are saying when he's making decisions and not what people in his cabinet or in his party are telling him. All right, Jessica, Dina, Marcus, thank you very, very much. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you leaving some snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Ahead tonight, protesters disrupt commutes in cities across the country. We look at the Extinction Rebellion. But first, would free prescription drugs make a difference in Canadian lives? New research right after the break. We'll see you in two. So affordability was a major focus of tonight's English language debate, and one expense many Canadians struggle with is medication. Now, three parties promise some kind of national pharmacare program. The Liberals say they'll spend $6 billion over four years to kickstart a program, though not all of it for prescription drugs. The NDP is promising $10 billion annually and says the program will be up and running by ne late next year. And the Greens say they'd spend $26.7 billion on a pharmacare program in their first year alone. Now, it may seem obvious that providing free prescription medication would improve health outcomes, but according to new research out of Ontario, maybe not as much as you think. Cass Rusi explains. 
That was the albatross around my neck for the longest time. Beulah Jarvis is referring to a medication she needs to treat her asthma. At $180 per inhaler, she cuts corners to make it last longer. I was always scrambling to try to get the money to pay for it because it's something I really need. So I would stretch it out to two months. Jarvis needs to budget for a variety of drugs. She's self-employed and medications often take a back seat. It was really stressful and there were a lot of things that I couldn't buy food-wise. As many as one in 10 Canadians like Jarvis struggle to pay for the drugs they need, something Dr. Nav Persaud says has serious consequences. We have treatments for high blood pressure, treatments for diabetes, treatments for HIV AIDS, um, which can in some cases lengthen people's life expectancy by decades. Persaud and colleagues wondered what would happen if people who couldn't afford all their medications got them free of charge. Would they keep taking them and would their health improve? Their study looked at about 800 Ontario patients. One group received free medication. The other group had the usual access to their medication, taking it just over 26% of the time. At the end of one year, the group who got their drugs free had taken them 38% of the time. Getting folks to take their medicines on time is a really complex challenge. Financial barriers are one part of that. Um, when we take those away, things get better. The difference we saw was not very large. It was large enough um, to, um, to confer a, a clinically important benefit, like a reduction in the complications of diabetes. We also saw a large increase in the ability to make ends meet. My health is a bit better, so I'm able to work more. Jarvis was, was part of this study and says for her, getting free medication improved both her health and her quality of life. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, what inspired five friends to kayak for 69 days straight? Find out in our moment. But first, climate protests caused commuter chaos and in one city, tensions boiled over. We're back in two minutes. Jamie Poisson and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast Frontburner. We'll bring you highlights and analysis of tonight's federal leaders debate with power and politics host Vashi Capellos. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the National Newsroom in Vancouver. A federal judge has ordered U.S. President Donald Trump to hand over eight years worth of tax returns. The Manhattan judge rejected the president's argument that he had immunity from criminal investigations. Trump fired back on Twitter, blaming what he calls radical left Democrats for going after him. His lawyers have already appealed the ruling. An NBA team executive has apologized after sending a tweet in support of the Hong Kong protests. Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Houston Rockets, originally tweeted an image captioned, Fight for Freedom, Stand with Hong Kong. He stepped back today after criticism from Chinese fans, commercial partners, and the NBA, which is trying to increase its fan base in China. The league said it regretted Maury's remarks, and that, in turn, is not sitting well with some U.S. lawmakers. Try to gag uh, a general manager or anybody who is speaking out in favor of the Hong Kong protesters is wrong. China's state broadcaster said it would remove the team's games from its schedule. And Iraqi officials say a week of unrest has left more than 100 people dead and thousands more injured. The protests erupted in Baghdad over unemployment and a lack of public services last week. They continued overnight where at least 15 people were killed in clashes between government forces and large groups of protesters. Up next, climate protests shut down bridges across Canada, but in one city, inconvenience turned to anger. We're back in two minutes. Protesters were loud, disruptive, and impossible to ignore today, even gluing themselves to scaffolding and pavement. A group called Extinction Rebellion wants governments to treat climate change as a global emergency. 
Organizers have planned two weeks of civil disobedience and protests around the globe, blocking traffic everywhere from Sydney to Berlin. Now, here in Canada, they're targeting major urban centres, shutting down bridges and main roads, risking arrest in the process. And as Kayla Hounsell explains, along with support for their cause, there's sharp disagreement about how they're going about it. What do we want? Climate action! When do we want it? Now! Protesters disrupted the morning commute to make a point. It is time to act. We don't have the luxury of time as far as our climate goes, as far as the pollution goes, especially the water. Clean future! Rise up! They call the protest Bridge Out. The group behind it, Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion is 100% peaceful and nonviolent. It's an international movement started in the UK last year demanding countries, including Canada, reduce carbon emissions to net zero within six years. We're all citizens. We're all, we're in, we're all involved in this. There, there are no bystanders. Uh, and business as usual cannot carry on in the face of the climate crisis. We're, we are fast heading towards extinction. Today, police were a step ahead. Officers shut down the McDonald Bridge, a major artery into downtown Halifax, before protesters even arrived. Well, a lot of people have been inconvenienced, and I can tell you, speaking personally, that the agenda that some of these folks have been trying to bring forward, that we were coming on board with, has uh, flipped the switch this morning. While most seemed to agree with the message, many took aim at the method. This is what emergency looks like. From the Burrard Street Bridge in Vancouver to the Bloor Viaduct in Toronto, thousands of Canadians struggled to get to work. I'm sure glad you guys are doing your job. I know. In Edmonton, some drivers got out of their cars. How much pollution are we causing by the cars not moving? If he wants to make changes, go and do some research, go work for a university, go work, run as a member of parliament. We're going to be far more inconvenienced by the devastation created by the climate crisis. So we're going to ask you guys to leave peacefully. In Halifax, more than a dozen were willing to be arrested. Rebel with love for planet Earth. A small price to pay, they say, considering what's at risk. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Next on The National, our moment. A couple of kayakers share some of their favorite memories after 69 days of paddling. So these five friends took a bit of a trip this summer, not a regular holiday. They kayaked from Alaska to Vancouver Island. So ambitious and grueling, 69 days in all, but in the end, each friend had a different experience, a different favorite memory, and their collective reflection, that's our moment. And it was an incredible experience, I think the best summer of my life. And there were a couple hairy moments a whale just decided to get a mouthful of krill that happened to be right beside my boat and it was uh, one of the biggest surprises of my life to look over and and see this huge animal rising up out of the water um, and it, it pushed me sideways for a few moments and then uh, went back underwater and and left me um, all alone. A big pod of orcas started kind of coming towards us and then all of a sudden it pops up right in the middle of all of us and blows its blowhole and then swam under us and turned on its side and like did laps and lo looked at everyone. Your heart's racing because you think, is it going to eat me or is it <laughs> just want to look at me? You know, this trip has just made me realize how special our coast is and how I just really appreciate what we have. Beautiful pictures and, you know, as extraordinary as their adventure was, it's not exactly unusual, right? You go all through BC and I'm sure it's, it's true too right across the country and people are doing these more extreme adventures, uh, marathons, whether it's hiking, running, mountain climbing or kayaking. Uh, there are a lot of people out there a lot. Yeah, except the part you don't often hear about is how boring parts of it can be too, right? Like we have this romanticized idea of how these adventures usually turn out, and but they talk to us about how sometimes they'd just be out there and they'd, they'd literally count to 5,000 and then just keep cycling over and over again. There's a price to pay for those pictures. Well, it's, it sort of speaks to when they said one of their biggest highlights was catching a salmon. It took them 27 days, so you know, a gauge of that. Sounds like fun. Yeah, exactly. So that is a national for October the 7th. Good night. Good night. Hey.